Charlie Preston. Doing, the, doing these things is always kind of strange because, well, for one thing, for one thing, the mic is never low enough, even if I did it ahead of time. Um, I'm, I'm really not sure why I do this. Um, I really, I, no, I mean, really. The, the, the Austrian writer Karl Kraus is one of my real heroes, even though I have a lot of trouble reading him. He has to be read by me in translation. And since so much of it was topical, what you get is strings of aphorisms. Three and a half pages of it, and you're very tired. Uh, but as a, as a life, um, as a life, he's one of my heroes, as, as a man with a life. So he would always say about writers, you know, so-and-so, oh, he can't hold his ink. So I, I so, you know, I mean, that, that might be why I do this. I mean, I just haven't figured out how not to. I mean, sometimes I think that's the actual reason. Um, so, you know, you read these things. But I guess I've been doing it long enough to know that they're like jobs. So, right, here is Ray. Ray is new, they have it for sale, and there's something by Jessica in it, and there's also this piece that I'm about to read. Uh, I got interested in Electra because she seemed a very strange finger, figure in a number of ways. For one thing, her function in most of the plays and her story is variously told. It seems to be to provoke a train of events that will make herself disappear. You know, at, either as a voice or as a character. I mean, it, it literally happens in the libation bearers. The moment she sets in train the motion of events, she's gone from the whole rest of the trilogy. There's no more Electra. Um, for another, it, it, it's just the story is so variously told and with so many variations that she starts becoming a kind of character manifold, you know, like you can do a new Sherlock Holmes. Um, so I, I just, I thought I would start playing with it. And there's a, there's a long tradition of writing letters, you know, making up letters. Ovid did this, you know, book of letters that mythological figures were supposed to have written to one another. Um, so, you know, women write letters, they don't write plays, so I wrote a letter. And it's a work in progress, which means there's lots of rough spots and it's not done yet. I know where some of them are. There's a couple of really awful lines in this thing, by the way. And it's got a very pompous title. But the Princess Electra of Argos to her royal brother Orestes in exile. Greetings. Well, I suppose you want to know how things are back home. About the same, really. Nothing much ever changes here. I'm thinking of what she said to Aegisthus. Do you remember? It's the last two lines of the Agamemnon, and they've just finished their series of murders. The lines are variously rendered. I have to hand, for example, a rather, a rather moldy volume titled Plays of the Greek Dramatists, in which the translator, one Arthur S. Way, has seen fit to render the Orestia in a most peculiar pseudo-archaic god-wadding bombast, but Shakespearean enough, no doubt, to the bourgeois who paid $60 or so 50 years ago for this blue-bound, 30-volume set of the classics of world literature. As this parody of the socially insecure, overly snobbish critic of 50 years ago is no doubt convincing to the young people of today who wish it were still possible for them to be able to get their noses up in the air as far as the critic of 50 years ago was able to get his. But however sorry I might say I am for this, dear brother, that last paragraph is only the first of what I am afraid will be many such lapses in taste. Evil communications corrupt good manners, as the apostle says, and I long ago accustomed myself to flop without even a decent show of resistance into a not quite unconscious parody of any stray but usable style that happens to come my way. Haven't you any voice of your own, my creative writing teachers used to say? Of course not. I'm nothing but a pastiche of moldy fragments, the leftovers of other authors second guessing, and I stir my fragments, turn them over in my isolation, adding nothing, freshening nothing, watching myself rot. My manners, dear brother, are gone for good. Um, I'm going to skip a little of this, but this is the part I'm not so sure I like. Anyways, it, it, it's, you know, it's a, a bunch of people that doing bad translations. Uh, but I can't seem to find my favorite translation. I haven't read it in years, not since I had it in high school in accelerated English. And you probably had the same translation in your class, too. You might remember it. You and I will order all things well. Simple enough, that phrase, but as we were instructed, loaded with dramatic irony. For the Greek audience that heard those lines knew, brother, that by God Apollo's command, you would return in the next play to kill the guilty pair, 
They knew, too, that she would then be driven mad by the Furies, and they knew, finally, that in the last act of the last play, the gods would shrive you of your guilt and restore you to your sanity once they had discussed your case thoroughly in committee and taken a vote, majority rule. And once our English teacher got done explaining all of this, we knew it, too. So then we could see that the speaker of those lines was deluding herself, but not us or the audience. And we could see also, once our English teacher had instructed us to see it, that there was a purpose to this use of dramatic irony on the part of the author. Once we knew the proper interpretation of the Arrestia, we could see that the speaker of those lines had to be deluded, for no good order could possibly be founded on regicide, murder, and usurpation. And we could see that divine intervention would be needed before the trilogy closed to right the balance, redress these human trespasses, and reestablish justice and order upon the earth. He who is the instrument by which this order is reestablished must, of course, suffer himself, but suffering in such a cause is noble. In fact, we wondered, dear brother, or whether, rather we were instructed to wonder shortly before the end of class, whether you really did have a tragic flaw or whether you were an exception to the rule that the hero of a tragedy must have a tragic flaw. Perhaps you had no tragic flaw, and your suffering was merely the suffering of a man on whom a divine burden has been laid. Were you in that respect more like Hamlet? We decided we couldn't tell. One person suggested that since you didn't seem to have a flaw, you couldn't really be a hero. No one was very interested in the discussion, and so it petered out quickly two minutes before the class fell, when everybody started pulling their notebooks and papers together, signaling by the excessive noise that they didn't want to have to talk about this stuff anymore. Perhaps there was a discussion like this in your class as well. I understand the teaching methods have been pretty well standardized throughout Greece. Well, I've been digressing. The point is the dramatic irony of those two final lines. We could see that they were ironic to us, though not to her, because we knew that she didn't, that she and Aegisthus would not be able to order all things well. We could see all this because we didn't been instructed to see it. And we did see it because if we didn't see it, but instead resisted the correct interpretation of the play and substituted an interpretation we hadn't been taught. We were not going to get A's on the essay test we'd be taking shortly on the Arrestia, and if we didn't get A's on all the tests, we wouldn't get final grades of A's. And we dearly wanted to get our A's in accelerated English, didn't we, brother? I know I did. And I can well believe you did as well. Any mark of distinction was worth the utmost sacrifice, not only of time, but then it took next to no time to study for those tests, but of common sense and intelligent understanding as well. Now, whatever they said, we were prepared to split back, if not believe. Our A's depended on it. And so, I suppose, you are waiting for me to tell you how badly things are going here in Argos. But no, dear brother, I cannot tell you that, because there is something I must admit. But only to you, dear brother, to whom I never lie, and to you only in this very private letter, because, as all Argos is well aware, my public position is quite different. In fact, they have all ordered all things well. Not perfectly. Of course. But no reasonable person should expect perfection. There will always be the little troubles of life. The defective gas gauge in the family car, the need to repair the flashing around the gutters, the kitten with the mysterious intestinal illness that won't use the litter box. These things remain to trouble us in Argos. And, in fact, the trash collection tends to be a bit lackadaisical, and the postal workers have been threatening to strike again. The flowers look droopy. It's been hotter than usual again this year, for the fifth year in a row. The spring rain is scanty while the summer is one long drought. The Argive streets smell of an indefinable mixture of spit and sweat and urine and rotting ketchup. For you have to look very sharp to avoid stepping on the discarded half-empty plastic bags of ketchup that litter the sidewalks. And if you step on one, the gunk inside squirts out all over your shoes and your ankles, even squirts out up to your calves. I saw a woman just the other day ruin her new white suede pumps in Spain, a bright white with gray on skirt in a very ugly place by stepping in cautiously on a clump of those discarded ketchup packets. These tiny plastic bags are everywhere. They pop under everyone's toes, squirting out this half-rotten, kitschy stage blood that clings and stinks and stains irreparably. Everything it touches. Um, I got to do this. It's worse than the holidays when the common people are out walking, eating cheeseburgers, and throwing away the ketchup packets for others to step on and slip and curse the slime. One of the many reasons I have for hating our holidays. But the common people all claim to love them, and there are more and more of these holidays, and more and more people turn out for each one. She and he are always thinking up something new to bring the people out, some new festival of amusement. And the people all come out and walk around aimless, sweaty, and perplexed, having fun all afternoon, eating cheeseburgers and drinking soft drinks out of plastic cups and buying stuffed animals or balloons for their children. And after a while, the children grow tired and cranky. They've been out too long in the sun and have had too much sugar. 
So one child hits another, and the child that was hit hits back. And soon all the children are wailing, and their overtired parents slap the two or three loudest wailers across their bodies, and then everyone goes home. So things aren't perfect, no, but they are going fairly smoothly, and most of the people seem reasonably content. Apart from the threat and postal strike and the problems with garbage pickup and so forth, the fine sunburned children and their aimlessly wandering parents have few complaints and voice little discontent. Apart from the occasional outbursts of hysterical and rather mad rage, but, well, all those outbursts are mine. And everyone here thinks I'm a mad little idiot. Believe me, no one's listened to me in years. Okay, for those of you who might be wondering if there's any autobiographical content in this piece, yes, there it is. There it is. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I can rave as I please, and I do so from time to time. My well-known public position on the current regime demands it. From time to time, I rush out into the street, hair loose, feet bare, eyes sparkling with madness. It's a performance, of course, and not even an original one. I merely imitate Cassandra and one of her inspired frenzies, for example, the one in which she kept crying out that she saw the streets running with blood not yet shed. And that woman at least seems to have been completely sincere about it all. I, on the other hand, disgust myself with my secondhand belated enactments of the Virgin Prophetess. Well, I go through these performances, which are routine enough, and return home, sickened by it all. No one listens, of course, though a few applaud. Then it's back to my room with the books or the drudgery of an occasional day job. Don't think I'm treated all that badly. It's true that I'm not treated well, and it's showing as I get older, but though I'm a bit seedy looking, I'm hardly ravaged. The work I perform might be grudge work, but I do as little of it as I can possibly get away with. I, I can't get all the books I want, but if I try, I can get most of them. I never really have a problem with the public library. In fact, I'm usually the only patron that checks out the book, and I can renew it as long as I want, so my life isn't all that bad. Uh, I'm being left to die on the vine, to slowly burn myself out, but it's a lingering death by neglect and obscurity that I suffer, not a martyrdom by spectacular torments on the public square. You can see what I mean. They don't treat me badly at all. Here you can see the wisdom and circumspection of the rulers of this Argive regime. In all truth, dear brother, though I cannot admit it in public, I must admit it to you, to whom I never lied. They have ordered all things well. From time to time, I guess this temper gets the better of him, and he threatens something worse. Just the other day, in fact, our sister Chris of Famous, you remember her, don't you, dear brother, the waltz happy little fluff chick always out chasing after a boyfriend? Well, fashions change, and now she's into hip hop and Guatemalan and textiles. Well, Chris of Famous came running into my room all wide eyed and terrified, having heard that Odysseus was going to shut me up in some kind of sunless tower or something. I just laughed. I, I knew he wouldn't do that. He'll threaten it when he's annoyed, and I, I had done my best to be annoying that particular week, yes. Uh, he'll lose his temper and threaten worse than that. He's done it before, but as soon as he calms down, he'll see the difficulties involved in handling me in that fashion. They are apparent enough. If he reacts, it means he takes me seriously. If he tries to lock me up, it means I'm saying something dangerous. People might then start listening to what I have to say. They might wonder whether they aren't living under a tyranny after all whether the crimes of their rulers can only be purged in their rulers' blood, and so forth. And as word got out that I'd been locked up for criticizing the regime, the usual sorts of troublemakers in foreign lands might seize on the opportunity to embarrass the Argive government, which at present is generally held in high esteem abroad. Or, while the rulers of Argos are authoritarian in their methods, their commitment to public order and support for economic progress seems to be laying the foundation for a peaceful transition to democracy. But now, a troubling turn towards repression has been noted in the government of Argive strongman Aegisthus and his consort. Critics of the regime are receiving harsh treatment. Dignified letters of protest from foreign intellectuals are being received daily at the palace. Penn takes an interest in the case of the dissident Argive writer elector jailed without trial on a charge of disruptive protest directed at the current government. No direct communication is permitted with the prisoner. However, she is currently believed held in solitary confinement under harsh conditions and there are rumors that she is receiving forcible psychiatric treatment in the old Soviet manner. It would be a public relations disaster for them. <coughs> so of course they won't lock me up. Better to let me do my twice weekly bit of performance art while everyone else ignores me. I suppose you're about to ask an embarrassing question. I can anticipate what it is. Everybody else asks me the same question, too. What in God's name are you complaining about? What is your problem, Elector Girl? 
elect you're not a girl any longer. That's really what's eating at you, isn't it? The aunt had told that too. It's easy at this point to prepare for the press conference. Let me begin by admitting a few things at once. As to the murders and the usurpation, really, taking into account the broader historical circumstances, she indeed have done a remarkably enlightened thing. Their, their murders and usurpation have stopped the chain of revenge killings that have plagued the Sierra and Argos for generations. The seemingly endless blood feuds between the rival houses of the rival brothers, those two so closely related powers, sworn to mutual enmity. And wasn't it right simply to stop the killings, however it was done? Does it matter where the killings stop or who ends up the winner? Isn't talk of winners and losers here just a perpetuation of the same old tribal loyalties that created this pointless feud in the first place? Can we say that what they did was really wrong? It ended the strife. It ushered in a new era of well-managed prosperity and relative political freedom. Peace and economic opportunity, these are the real needs of the people, and they have both. Even though they still complain that there's too much month left at the end of the money and that the garbage collection is atrocious. And they are content with life in this time of stable progress. Even though the city is beginning to look tattered and faded like a rag left out too long in the sun, and even though the children get sunburned and fight and make each other cry, still, to take those endless strolls along the blazingly hot streets, littered with rotting ketchup packets, sipping soft drinks, and light flying balloons, isn't that worth all the murdered kings in the world? And this regime is not without energy. I don't mean to leave with that impression. No, it is full, in its own way, of passion and moral purpose. Concern for the less fortunate, for the less than beautiful, for the less than intelligent and the not very capable, for the physically disabled, the developmentally disabled, for those who hunt for lost quarters under mattresses by the light of their cigarette lighters, and those who cannot seek to seem to keep from mixing household ammonia with clothing and bleach. We care for all of these. For our dream here in Argos is that one day no one will suffer. No one will be deformed or stricken or feel the pain of separation or the loss of all we most love. To be continued. There's lots more. There's lots more to come. <laughs> now, okay, let's see. How long is Yeah. We don't have too much more time. <coughs> see, this is a problem when you write prose. It takes a long time to get through anything. Um, hmm. Has anybody in this room ever heard of Thomas Bernhard? No. Anybody at all? Anywhere? Zip. Yes? No. Cone. Cone? Yeah, Mr. Cone, yeah. Well, I probably should not read a parody of Thomas Bernhard to get another audience who's never heard of him, so. Um, He's an uh, author of, just recently died, and author of several novels and a number of plays. And I guess you have to go look him up, but it's not going to help much to be a parody of him. Um, okay, how about Lost in the Flats? This is, this is something I wrote like four years ago in our local brag. <laughs> You've heard of the flats, okay. <laughs> well, Oh, that's lovely. They got a little industrial, little little industrial sound going for this industrial piece here. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. This might be what I'm complaining about. I don't know. Okay. Industrial civilization works something like slash and burn agriculture. A part of a city or a region or a country or a world is worked for a few years. And then the boys in management seem to decide they've gotten all they can out of it and move on. The hoopla and glitz and trendsetters move on too. And since nothing seems to be real out in our world unless it is reflected in dozens of media mirrors, what's left behind when it slips out of the gaze of the players seems to blur, to turn hazy, even in the minds of people who used to know it was there. But unlike slash and burn peoples whose lightly built shelters go back to the earth in a few rainy seasons, Industrial civilizations leave plenty of solid stuff behind when they move on. From at least 1950 on, the city of Cleveland had an asphalt plant at 2900 West 3rd Street. Bridges and docks maintenance, sewer maintenance, and the city towns were at the same address at the southern end of West 3rd in the flats, near where the road used to ramp up to and join the Clark Pershing Bridge. Part of the ramp still stands, and from its top, the pylons of the old bridge can still be seen crossing the Cuyahoga Valley to the area of the LTV steel plant. 
1982, the asphalt plant was put out of service. It needed repairs, too many to justify the cost. The city moved all its services at that address to other locations. Some of the people I talked to in the city government thought Jones and Laughlin had bought the land, but Jay and Al, although they took a look, decided not to buy. It appears the city still owns the land, although the address has vanished off the county records. The asphalt plant is still standing. It's on your right if you're driving to out south on West 3rd Street, around the bend from the Chessie System Roundhouse, across from the, uh, le across from the yard where the Cuyahoga Valley Line steam locomotives are stored. It's completely open, and no one stops you from going inside unless the guard from the Chessie System yard happens to come over. I couldn't recommend going through it at night. There's more than one open stairwell and at least one with a 15-foot drop onto solid concrete. We went through it on a 96-degree day, but it was nowhere near as hot as it must have been when the plant was in operation, mixing 220-degree asphalt with the hot gravel and sand from the barber green dryers. The office. Maybe 20 tires are piled up outside and as many gas tanks. How to dispose of old tires and gas tanks, the great problem of inner-city proven life. The office was in a one-story brick building with many windows now all broken out. A smashed miniature TV overgrown with thistles lies on the ground near the door. Inside, all the wiring has been pulled out. Two filing cabinet drawers and several banker's boxes lie on the floor, which is ankle-deep in papers and detritus. The asphalt plant's weekly production record form, listing output by foreman, a copy of the city record from June 6, 1979, an old catalog from the George Worthington Company, a four of clubs, receiving tickets from Apex Builders Supply and the Standard Slide Company, two 1974 copies of Muhammad Speaks, a, body, a bottle of anti-diarrheal medication, a Christmas time 1982 plain dealer, dispatcher's tickets, leaving plant, arrive on street, leaving street, forming the sign time when arriving and leaving with trucks. A couch lies on its side in the middle of the floor. Fifty-five dollar gallon drums are scattered around. Leaks and spills. A low metal shed stands between vertically mounted cylindrical tanks. One side of the shed has been bashed in as if someone ran into it with a truck and the shed leans a little. Inside the shed, a complicated system of pipes and valves feeds in from the asphalt storage tanks and out again to the cold and hot mixed plants. This was the pumping station. Some, plant, some pipes are red with rust, others black with asphalt, still others have a white caulking or insulation on them. Heavy flex tubing, about four inches in diameter, leads away from the pipes and valves toward the ground. A little asphalt is sunking from it, liquefied in the heat, hardening on the surface. The door to the pumping station is stuck open in asphalt of several inches depth. When the door is moved back and forth, the asphalt cracks a little. This door is a steel gray at its top. Asphalt splatters black in it until it is entirely black, on what can be seen at the bottom. Yellow safety paint and white paint have also been dripped down the door. It looks like a Jackson Hollow. A truck-mounted asphalt distributor from the PB Patcher Company, California, sits in the yard in front of the house, in front of the office. It drips asphalt. The coal mix plant was in the smaller of the two largest buildings, which looked like overgrown corrugated metal sheds. The mixing tank inside oozes and puddles asphalt, a few dozen square feet of semi-solid stuff. The large horizontally mounted cylindrical storage tanks next door have oozed enough asphalt to cover the ground between the tanks and the plant. All the buildings near the tanks have been splashed with asphalt. Their grayish steel color is overlaid with black splashes and ochre and tan rust streaks and weather stains and spilled white and yellow paint. The silos are the most visible and largest part of the plant complex. They are tall concrete semi-cylinders joined in the middle by a narrow concrete waste and held sand and gravel. Two doors, like the doors that opened in the coal furnaces, sit at the bottom of the waste. They have been forced open, and gravel spills out from each, forming two mounds which flow towards each other and join. Machinery and what it did. The low metal door to the silos, only a little over five inches high, five feet high, stands open, much weathered and streaked by rust. Inside the silo, a chute brought down gravel and sand from storage. An underground system of hoppers and conveyor belts brought the material into the hot mix plant next door, feeding it into the barber green dryer, a cylindrical structure perhaps 20 or 25 feet long, propped up on girders at one end to produce an incline of about 30 degrees. The barber green spun, turning over and heating the materials to separate out impurities and dry out the water. 
From there, the sand and gravel were carried up to the main mixer and mixed with the liquid asphalt pumped in from the storage tanks. The tanks held AC, cut back asphalt, asphalt fluxed with gasoline, kerosene, and the like to produce a liquid rather than a semi-solid substance. The volatile materials evaporate on exposure to the air, leaving a solid pavement. Tanker trucks, trucks shifted into the plant. In the rear of the cold mix plant, a large square metal tank half projecting out of the building holds, even in the Ju July drought, perhaps 250 cubic feet of standing rainwater. Water for the city cement trucks was heated here. In winter, the materials being mixed on the truck would freeze if hot water was not used. Heating elements passed through the bottom of the tank. Next to it are two machines labeled Honeywell Fluid Powered Gas Valve and Immerso Pack Burner. But my ability to link up machine with machine is limited. Nothing is done here anymore. Nothing moves. The machines have been uh, reduced to arrangements of gears and switches, more or less aesthetically striking and more or less intact. Smashed force one. At one end of the office building were the break room and washroom for the drivers. The walls of concrete block painted red to a height of a little more than five feet but irregularly shaped patches of green and white paint also appear. All shaped metal light fixtures hang from the ceiling. The vent for a hot water tank projects from the wall, but the hot water tank itself has been removed. Sink pipes project from the walls. Most of the fixtures are gone. On the floor, a porcelain toilet or urinal has been smashed to bits. In the cold mix building at the back end, a large wooden toolbox stands open and empty. Next to it, an aluminum pot lies on the floor, is something indistinguishable from asphalt sticking to its bottom. Between this area and the water heating tank, there must have been a restroom, but whatever partitioned it from the rest of the plant is gone, the fixtures have been smashed. A metal towel dispenser hangs on the wall, empty, with its still readable sign, Ask Attendant to install clean towel. Transformers and fuse boxes. The rusted conduit which runs down the face of the silo is missing some of its place plates, and the old-fashioned wires with braided insulation can be seen through the open spots. Throughout the office building and the small metal sheds, outlets have been stripped out when possible, or sometimes simply pulled out and left dangling. Inside the cold mix plant, near the back, is the older-style square D 440-volt fuse box, with lever-style main disconnect no longer live, all the cartridge fuses removed. Inside the hot mix plant, the big fuse and control boxes have all been ripped apart. Fuse holders and switches dangle from their wires. Apparently nothing could be carried away for salvage, so the boxes were simply vandalized and left. One box looks as if someone had taken a sledgehammer to it. With the fuses removed, it was a cheap enough, it was a safe enough cheap throw. The danger high voltage sign is still tacked to the wall next to the box. Between the two main plants, the cold mix and the hot mix, is a high wire fence topped with barbed wire whose gate is locked with a rusty pad box. The fence encloses a small square area into which high voltage cables feed from the overhead power lines down to the plant complex's main transformer and from there into the plant's buildings. The transformer is live and buzzes loudly. It is almost completely covered by a grapevine, which is spread over the small enclosure and through the fence and is attempting to grow up the wall of the cold mix building wherever the asphalt will let it grow. The buzzing fills the air, mixing with the thick smell of leaking asphalt, covering the parched, thistle-filled ground rusty 55-gallon drums, the smashed glass, and flat tires. Abandoned industrial buildings live a twilight life. Anybody who used to work in them has gone someplace else. At book value, land and improvements are worth too much to be unloaded cheap, but the real value of an obsolescent plant is often almost nothing. The cost of tearing it down and rebuilding with modern equipment often can't be economically justified. Better to move on while the plant remains vacant, awaiting some massive turnaround in its fortunes that will restore it to productive use. As it stands up and slowly deteriorating, the plan, plant acquires new uses not foreseen in its original plans. It becomes a place for wandering, drinking, dumping, doing drugs, having sex, a shelter in bad weather, a quarry for scrap metal and percussion instruments, a place to vandalize or take photographs in or do performance out in. It's a zone where nothing is forbidden, use your imagination, out of sight, out of mind. The hoppers and conveyor belts of the asphalt plant don't move, the mixers don't turn, the tanks are all leaking, the wiring is torn out and the fuse box is smashed. The asphalt plant has kept the form of a great machine, but its parts don't connect up. It's become aesthetic because it's useless. It doesn't make anything that's any use to be made of it. Almost no unnoticed, the plant sits by the side of the road and the light that held slowly breaks and disconnects and crumbles and leaks away.
write prose, it takes you forever to read just a little bit of it. So, you know, you read a long thing and then you're done. Thanks. Thanks for coming. Something else may happen later. Who knows? <laughs> Drink more. <laughs>